I got a question for you. Which would pull more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and be more eco-friendly, better for the planet? Bang a $60 Pella compostable phone case. And this is compostable and biodegradable, which is so, so cool. I think people like me who try to be a little bit more eco-conscious and eco-friendly, and we want an easy way to go about doing that. Um, we look for products that are like this, that say they are 100% um, compostable. Or burying $50 in the ground, buying a $3 case from China, and burning the rest. Yeah, I think you might be able to see where this one's going. And yes, that is the same Pella that made Lomi, and threatened to sue me for the busting video I made on it. The irony, of course, now being that uh, now that people have actually got their Lomis and have actually tried them out, the comments from them look remarkably like my predictions in the busted video. Where is my product? Blah, blah, blah. I loved my Lomi for the first four months, then it stopped working. The grinder appears to be stuck. Don't get this product. My Lomi worked for a total of three months. Blah, blah, blah. Don't buy. My Lomi stopped working. The grinder is no longer moving. Seems like it's sealed to the bottom of the bucket. Yeah. Well, that's um seven million dollars well spent. So let's see what else this uh, amazing company makes. We started with the idea of uh, Pila and creating a uh, compostable and biodegradable phone case from natural resources. Ah, yes, of course. Natural resources like um, oil. Yes, one billion extra pieces of plastic enter into the waste stream every single year. And we know plastic doesn't go away. Well, uh, biodegradable plastic does. Sure would be kind of awkward if it turned out the most phone cases were made out of... Um, biodegradable plastic that did just uh, go away. So this is Pila, the world's first compostable phone case. So when you're done with it, you can toss it in your backyard compost and away it goes. Pila, the phone case for people who care. Now the first thing you'd ask about a $60 case is, does it work? And of course, Pella did their own tests with their bubbly, friendly, spontaneous influencers. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Penelope from Pila Labs, and boy am I excited to show you this. You two are gonna have so much fun! You wanna know how protective our Pila phone cases are? Watch this. Don't act any cheerier, Diane. You'll give us all diabetes. Bite me, Tom. And it worked every time. Until, of course, there was an independent test done. But as an iPhone case reviewer, the only question I have is... Will it protect my iPhone? Because at the end of the day, I am guessing that a broken OLED screen is going to cost more environmentally than whatever this compostable case is going to be able to save. Will it protect my iPhone? Yeah. But I'll be honest with you, I've got 99 problems and a broken iPhone screen is actually one of them. Now, when it comes to design, the Pella case isn't great from my perspective. It's of average width and is very thin, which is usually a good feature, but the lack of edge protection coupled with an extremely loose edge is actually a really bad combination. But the Pella case is only $60 and it's compostable, which means it's much better than biodegradable. I mean, compostable means that it'll Compost away in about six months, whereas biodegradable takes a, a couple of years. They claim that they are compostable, which means they should break down within 90 days. And I'm just kind of curious to know if that will actually happen. And Pella even had a video showing how awesomely quick their phones would compost. And far be it from me to call this all staged and faked marketing bullshit. But yeah, it's fake, which has now been demonstrated more than once by people actually burying their uh, Pella phone cases to see how well they are composted. Um, this top one is the one that was buried in the woods. This middle one is the one that was buried in the garden. And then this bottom one was the one in the compost. So the one we put in the compost obviously is the one that looks the most degraded. And then the second one, it would be the one in the woods looks the second most kind of that composed the best. And then the middle one, the one that was planted in the garden kind of really didn't decompose really at all. Honestly, I was kind of really disappointed because 
So Mobile Reviews, a Monty and I base our reviews on actual usage. Now compostable cases are starting to become a fad, I think. That's the uh, Pella case that I buried seven months ago. I think people like me who try to be a little bit more eco-conscious and eco-friendly. If you're new here, we make these Buy Ensemble reviews to help make supporting and purchasing people and planet-friendly products and companies much easier. And we want an easy way to go about doing that. Um, we look for products that are like this, that say they are 100% um, compostable. So by their own definition, it's not really a compostable case. It's more biodegradable, which I'm sure is much better than a $3 case from China. Right? On the cases themselves, you might see that they say designed in Canada. They refrain saying anything about the manufacturing in China. Indeed, is it actually made from a different material? About 45% of this case is made from renewable resources, which is cool, but the other 55% is not. So basically half this case is some form of plastic, while the other half isn't. And we know plastic doesn't go away. Or another suggestion would be is that the uh, Pella case is actually made of exactly the same plastic as other phone cases, and they could also make this claim, if they so desired, based on their feedstock chemicals. Now, I'm usually pretty good with my polymers, but I honestly didn't know what phone cases were made from. Fortunately, when I did my Sio Busted video, I got this amazing gizmo, ludicrously priced new, eh, just expensive secondhand. Thank you, patrons. But they can identify plastics for you. Good, so here I have three plastics, which I'm gonna identify with my spectrometer here. So the first thing I have to do is scan something. And when we do this, you'll get a little laser spot. Um, there's my little laser spot. And if I focus that down to a point on the surface, we get a bit of a molecular signal, which is good. And it does an analysis and it comes back and it tells me that this unidentified plastic here is polyethylene. Polyethylene. Oh, propylene. Okay, so polyethylene, polypropylene, very similar plastics. But what about this guy? This guy feels mm, harder somehow. Yeah, so let's see, should take a look at the uh, spectra of that one. So there's your spectra. Let's scan up this guy. And straight away it gets a an analysis and it tells me it's polystyrene well most likely and the reason is you'll get this huge spike here and then our last unidentified plastic oh there we go and polytetrafluoroethane so, and we take a look at the spectra there, and yeah, right. So these things are usually fairly simple to identify. Now the simple truth is, I don't actually know what polymer this guy is in my very, very cheap uh, $3 phone case, which I've had already for years. Right, this thing's really hung in there. Okay, so the moment of truth. Let's see what my phone case is made from. And here we go. We have the moment of truth. And it's made of... What the hell is that? It's uh, biphenyl methyl. Okay, I know what those are. Okay, lots of fluorescence. Let's not worry too much about that. View info, there we go. And it's a butane diol and an adipate. That means this thing is probably pretty biodegradable. Well, let's go back to polymers. All polymers are long chain molecules that yeah, sometimes cross-linked. Most of the times they're just a sort of garbled mess, like messed up string. Most of those chains are made up of carbons. 
And as a general rule, the more oxygens you have in that chain, the more biodegradable the polymer is going to be. With cellulose, the most abundant biomolecule on the earth, being a bit of an exception here. Now, the reasons for that, of course, is the more oxygen you get in there, typically in the more hydrophilic the stuff is, and the more likely it is to spend a little bit of its tangled time in water where it can be chewed up by bacteria. And the enzymes metabolize those bonds which have oxygen in them more easily. And give or take, every time you break a bond, you more or less halve the molecular weight of the polymer, and eventually you get down to small enough fragments that they're water soluble, at which point the bacteria can really go to town on them eating them and metabolizing them in much the same way that your digestive system does to give carbon dioxide and water. So polyethylene like this is a tough one for bugs to crack because no oxygen. But polyurethane elastomers like this, I'm pretty sure that that'll look like this after it's been buried in wet soil for six months. But hey, only one way to be certain. Yes, that's right. This guy is going to get buried in the soil and we'll come back to it in six months' time. Now, I didn't actually know any of that when I bought this case um, about three years ago, nor did I particularly care, because there is no way you can sensibly make any contribution to climate change by something as small as a phone case. I mean, this phone case weighs up 25 grams, and it's already got three years on the clock. So, I mean, if I were to burn that phone case to release all of that carbon as carbon dioxide, it makes give or take 25 grams of carbon dioxide. Yeah, I mean, sure, I know it's a bit more, but whatever. You know, simple numbers, it more or less gives its own weight in carbon dioxide. So, you know, even if I saved all of it, then the best case scenario is I stop 25 grams of carbon dioxide from getting into the atmosphere. Okay, so here's the problem. Every minute, a truckload of plastic made from fossil fuels is dumped into the ocean. Yeah. You mean like most of the Pella case? So basically half this case is some form of plastic, while the other half isn't. Burning of fossil fuels is what causes temperatures to rise, and the last 10 years have been the hottest in history. Not caused naturally, but by you and me. If we continue like this, plastic in the oceans will outweigh fish. The birds and the bees will no longer exist. So what are we doing? Oh, oh, I, I, I think I knew this one. Operationally insignificant gesture to sell massively overpriced phone cases to green, gullible, scientifically illiterate hippies. I mean, really, $60. If I were to ask you, you know, what's the weight of a pellet case in dollar bills? Well, a single dollar weighs about a gram. So $2 weighs two grams. $3 weighs three grams and so forth. So that's actually $50 there, which weighs just over 50 grams. So that's not even enough there to buy a pallet case. And it's sequestered at least twice as much carbon out of the atmosphere. Dollar bills are made mostly of biopolymers like cellulose. So would my carbon footprint be better offset by simply burying $50 in the ground buying a $3 crappy case from China or a pallet case. Oh, 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 this one is a doozy. I mean, let's start with some simple perspective numbers. When NASA sent men to the moon, because they were going to be putting them inside a giant sealed Coke can for a couple of weeks, they needed to know what they had to put in there to keep them alive. So that is how much oxygen your body needs to stay alive every day in terms of mass and what your body does with that is it'll burn about a kilo of sugar and i did an experiment very much like this a few years back just to give you some idea of how much power your body gets through in a day whether it's eaten and enzymatically converted into carbon dioxide and water by your metabolism or oxidized by chemical oxygen makes relatively little difference to the amount of energy released this fireball is releasing about every 10 seconds the energy that your body consumes in a day. About every 10 seconds, it's releasing the amount of carbon dioxide you generate in a day. So you've got a choice. You can either burn a kilo of sugar or yeah, half to a third of a kilo of oil, either or. So this is now gloriously what your body does every day. It's about a kilo of oxygen burns a kilo of sugar, to make a kilo of carbon dioxide and a kilo of water. So if you breathe out about a kilo of carbon dioxide per day, 
that means you're breathing out about one gram of carbon dioxide per minute. It means that you're actually lighter now than when you started watching the video. So I breathe out more carbon dioxide than this phone case in about an hour. And that phone case doesn't just last an hour, it lasts years and will most likely be pretty biodegradable. And that's just the carbon footprint for breathing. A mediumly efficient first world lifestyle, you can more or less add a zero onto your carbon emissions. With typical annual carbon emissions for just breathing being about half a ton and a first world lifestyle about five tons. Or if you prefer them per minute, you breathe out about one gram of carbon dioxide per minute or it's about 10 grams if you include the first world lifestyle. So to get the carbon footprint for a phone case like this requires just being alive for about 20 minutes or a typical first world lifestyle for two, which just highlights the tiny nature of the carbon footprint of a phone case like this. And to boast about using slightly less energy for it, that's just kind of dumb. On average, Pila case uses 30% less water and 25% less carbon dioxide emissions as compared to a conventional plastic phone case. This means we can get a carbon neutrality or carbon negative using our natural materials. That's a lot of science. No, that's a lot of stupidity. And because this sort of thing bugs me, let's take a look at those formulas they have on the board, shall we? Well, top right, we've got a modified ethylene of some sort used in radical polymerizations, but uh, that would leave you an entirely aliphatic backbone, which wouldn't be terribly biodegradable. Then lower down on the right side, we have some uh, carboxylic acid group and an amide, maybe? Difficult to tell, they've not really completed it, nor is that particularly relevant to anything. On the bottom left, however, is something that's a little more interesting. We have what looks, with a little scratching, to be polyphenylene oxide. And my instant response is that thing is going to have the properties fairly similar to polystyrene, which just turns out is about right, and would also not be terribly biodegradable, given that virtually the entire constitution of the polymer is made up by aromatics. What is maybe a little more interesting is the section under properties. Through modification and incorporation of fillers, such as glass fiber, the properties can be extensively modified. But it would fit very well with what their sales pitch is, which is basically they've taken a regular fossil fuel industries plastic and just mixed in some cellulose fiber. What's left is the actual straw, and uh, the fiber in the straw is actually so strong that the uh, farmers often burn it because it gets caught up in the equipment. So we want to find another use for that straw. Yeah, which is kind of one of the reasons why let me is such a dumb idea. In that, yes, that cellulose waste is very good at clogging up machines. So we uh, grind it up and we use it in our phone cases to help it be more environmentally sustainable. But hey, mixing in stuff with polymers is yeah, sort of fairly routine stuff. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they just used exactly the same polyurethane that is in the regular phone cases. And then just mix in some waste cellulose and boom, you can make claims like this. On average, Pila case uses 30% less water and 25% less carbon dioxide emissions as compared to a conventional plastic phone case. But only one way to be certain. Now I've got ethical considerations about giving companies like this money. But if anyone out there has a Pila case, I don't need the whole thing. I just need a tiny sample and I can tell you exactly what plastic is in it. Yes, I'm looking at you, Eleanor, and you, Mobile Review Air. The ones that you buried in the garden, they would be fine if you've not thrown them away yet. In fact, if you've got them, just send me samples of all of those biodegradable phone cases, and I'll bet dollars to donuts they're all made of exactly the same material. Uh, the main reason being the obvious one that... Uh, Aging in a polymer whilst you're using it is a bad thing. You don't want the phone case to age away whilst you're using it. You know, just because it gets splashed with water every now and then. But I uh, do want it to age away over a couple of years once it gets wet for an extended period of time. And that'll put a natural limit on the suitable plastics you can use for this. Put simply, I have doubts that the clear plastic used in the pellet case is any different than that used in mine. Which brings us on to the key question. Is a compostable phone case actually worth anything? Really, anything at all? Or are you just being sold a completely, utterly, 
utterly stupid feature for $50? Well, yes. You see, if your goal is keeping carbon out of the atmosphere, then having a biodegradable phone case is actually better than a compostable one because it will take longer to release the carbon back into the atmosphere. However, if your sales pitch is a compostable phone case is better because it releases the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere more quickly, well, this is one slight problem with that. I can do that in seconds using something the uh, cavemen called fire. Yeah, burning it and composting it give exactly the same products. Just burning it is a damn sight quicker and cheaper. Plus you can use the excess heat from burning to run things like generators. And all of these methods will release exactly the same amount of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. In fact, consumer plastics constitute such a small amount of our carbon footprint that it really doesn't make a fat lot of difference either way. I mean, let me give you an example. Burning a kilo of gasoline or a kilo of phone cases will release almost exactly the same amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So a kilo of phone cases would be about 50 or so of these cases. A lifetime supply of phone cases for someone. And for an equal carbon footprint of gasoline, you'd be looking at about a kilo of gasoline, that litre, that sort of thing, that would drive your car about 12 kilometres or eight or so miles. So simply by not taking the car for eight miles, that's your lifetime carbon emission from phone cases. Further, burning doesn't just decompose these biodegradable plastics, but it'll also be very effective at uh, fast degrading the plastics with a very long lifetime in the environment. Things like polyethylene. So here we have a polyethylene slash polypropylene um, syringe. It's basically the same material. And this stuff will actually burn fairly well. It burns kind of like candle wax. Yeah, fairly clear colorless flame, no real soot whatsoever. You put it into pure oxygen, the noise you can hear is an oxygen generator. You get it into the pure oxygen and it's, uh, it gets a little more excited, but it's still largely a, a sootless flame. But the reason I've got the oxygen going is a different reason. So here we have our case and we just need to take a little slice out of my case. So let's have a nice little sliver like this. There we go, that's about right. Cool. So, now we have a sample of this elastomer. And I've got no idea how this is going to burn. My guess is it'll be with a sooty, smoky flame. But once we get it into the pure oxygen, or just compressed gas, you know, the sort of thing you get in an incinerator, it'll burn away to nothing absolutely fine. So let's see how this works out. Okay, so I've got no idea how this is going to go. And he sort of burns. Okay, yeah, there is some soot. You get into the uh, the oxygen, and yeah, it burns away absolutely fine. Going to get hot. Super. Done. No smells, no nothing. Cool. So I'm now tempted. I'm not sure how much of the aromatic is in here. So I'm going to cut out a little bit more of this stuff because I want to sniff what that smells like. So I want another slice of this boy. I suspect that it's mostly aliphatic. And there's only a little bit of the aromatic isocyanate in there. I want to sniff what this is like when it's burning. Okay, let's see what this does for us. That's burning. It smells kind of like fireworks. But it is mostly burning away to nothing. It's not got this hugely sooty flame that you usually expect from... Ah, oh, there is a bit of soot in there. But it mostly just melts. You know, you can see it's just melted here. 
So I suspect that is probably got a fairly small aromatic content to it. You can toss it in your backyard compost and away it goes. So here it is. Um, we did find it in the compost um, and it's basically almost fully intact. Either way, a damn sight quicker of getting it back into the atmosphere than putting it in a compost pile. Not quite how palisols it though. They're carbon neutral. You know we've got that whole anti-plastic thing in the bag, but that's not enough. We became climate neutral certified by offsetting as much carbon as we emit. Really? Offset? The irony is I could hyper offset this uh, carbon footprint used by a regular fungus from China and half a kilo of carbon dioxide. No, not as an offset. You buy a canister of literal carbon dioxide for $35. And yes, bury it in the ground and congratulations, you've now basically offset the carbon footprint of every phone case you will ever own. Hell, I could offset the uh, carbon footprint of a phone case with some sort of uh, cellulose, you know, stuff that's really slow to biodegrade, you know, essentially stored there. By burying a mere $30 in the ground that would offset the uh, carbon footprint of this phone case and still be much cheaper than a Pella case. Yeah, when your great carbon offset can be beaten simply by burying money in the ground. Pila, the phone case for people who care. It's probably fair to say you're unlikely to reach a mass market. Not that it's probably relevant, of course, because carbon offsets are mostly PR bullshit. And whilst John Oliver might be a little sketchy in places, on carbon offsets, he basically hits it out of the park. And when you buy an offset so you can pollute more, and that offset is bullshit, you're now actively making things worse. In fact, that study argues the sale of those offsets substantially increased global carbon dioxide emissions, which clearly is not very good. We became climate neutral certified by offsetting as much carbon as we emit. The benefits of carbon offsets are wildly overstated, while the harm they can do is very real. Fundamentally, we cannot offset our way out of climate change. But, but Pella is certified carbon neutral. Surely that must mean something, right? The bottom line is, we have an offset system that places profits over science and the rules regulating it are just far too lax. And the reason I know that is, we set up Oliver's Offsets Carbon Registry, and I'm thrilled to announce an exciting new project that meets our exacting standards. Don't worry, you can save these trees. Simply by sending me one dollar. We are issuing 10,000 carbon credits, each of which will stop me cutting this tree down for exactly five minutes. Sadly, Oliver's Offsets was all sold out of carbon credits by the time I got there, which is a shame because otherwise I could have, a. Uh, claimed that I'd saved a 10 ton tree from being cut down. That's like 10 tons of carbon credits for the amazing price of $1. Let's see, 10 ton tree, that's 10 million grams, 20 grams of phone case. I could have offset the carbon footprint of half a million Pella phone cases for this. Let's see, half a million Pella phone cases at $60 a piece. That's $30 million of phone cases Offset for one dollar. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. How wonderfully green of them. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean that. I mean, how wonderfully in the green for them. We're in the money. <laughs> yeah, it's a damn sight more profitable to claim to save the planet than to actually save it. You know, just like it's easier to claim you've made a compostable phone case than to actually make one. Anyway, many thanks to those who made worried inquiries about how I had kind of vanished offline after making this video critical of the very stupid Saudi idea of building a very expensive uh, computer-generated city in the middle of nowhere, because reasons. Including, and I was quite touched by this, one from the British Association of Journalists. Thankfully, I'm fine. I just had to be in Germany for a couple of weeks to do an experiment, which was kind of a full-time thing. The science was interesting, but my God, was it beautiful. One of the things we were working on was benzophenone and the radical anion, which, for those who want to know, is just one of the prettiest, bluest solutions ever. Horrifically air-sensitive, 
but very pretty. Also got this amazing picture of not of an iceberg, but of a potassium berg. Yeah, that's actually metallic potassium there floating in tetrahydrofuran. Yeah, that's the stuff that explodes in water, but still pretty. But now, after another busy week or two, I should be mostly back. So, many thanks for all the support. Thumbs up and subscribing might be nice if you enjoyed the video. And of course, if you really like this work and want to support it directly, you can do it through Patreon. And uh, thanks for watching.